As I've mentioned on this show before, the Nintendo Entertainment System wasn't really a strong seller in the UK. As a kid in primary school, I only had a single friend who owned the system, and from what I can remember the times I spent at his house, he never even touched it. He was a lot more interested in the games he owned for his other systems. I recall him telling me one time that I wouldn't even like anything for it anyway. My point being is that the NES wasn't exactly popular where I'm from, holding only about 10% of the English gaming market. Due to this media blackout of sorts, there's a first party Nintendo IP which has since faded into obscurity, with much of the world never even knowing of its existence, which is a damn shame really, because after discovering it recently, I wholeheartedly believe it to be one of the finest games the Nintendo Entertainment System has to offer. And because of that, I think I missed out on what should have been a very large part of my childhood. I'm talking about the extremely underrated masterpiece that is Star Tropics. Developed by Nintendo Integrated Research and Development in 1991, Star Tropics was targeted specifically at Western audiences. To this day, it has still never been released in Japan, which is almost criminal because I think the game would have been incredibly successful with a worldwide release. The game's plot revolves around a young baseball enthusiast named Mike Jones who lives on the fictional tropical island of Americola. One day, when Mike goes to visit his archaeologist uncle Dr. Jones, his uncle's assistant Babu informs Mike that Dr. Jones has gone missing. Obviously, because of this, Mike takes his uncle's submarine and goes off to find him. Shortly after, Mike finds a message from his uncle telling the boy that he has been abducted by aliens and that he needs Mike to go rescue him. This launches an epic and captivating adventure across an archipelago of the South Seas, where, incidentally, every island's name ends with cola, where Mike must traverse dangerous caves, solve devious puzzles, brave deadly waters, and fight enormous bosses. He meets many charming and wacky friends along the way who will help him on his journey to save his uncle, such as a talking dolphin family, a fisherman who's been swallowed by a whale, and an island populated exclusively by women. Come on, it's hard to say you're not even a little interested by this point. What's not to love about this concept? A colorful tropical adventure filled with excitement, action, puzzle solving, a quirky plot, and a crazy cast of fascinating characters. If you like what you're hearing so far, I haven't even told you about the best part yet. The game itself. Right away, Star Tropics presents you with a beautifully detailed tropical backdrop for the title screen, and Hitting Star brings you to a screen familiar to anybody who's ever played a Zelda game before. After registering your file, you're brought to the world map of the game which looks like something straight out of Final Fantasy or Dragon Warrior. Once you head to the nearby town, you can talk to NPCs just like in those classic RPGs, and after a short while you're given the task of going to search for your uncle and you head into the cave that cuts through the mountains on the way to Dr. Jones' lab. This is the first actual dungeon of the game, and this is where Star Tropics truly shines. The action segments for the dungeons play in a similar fashion to the original Legend of Zelda with an interesting twist. The dungeon screens are laid out as sort of a grid pattern where you move on a single square at a time. You can hold a direction to keep moving so as not to make movement annoying, but whenever you stop you will always be on a single square. Because of this you also can't make diagonal movements, but for the most part monsters in the dungeon abide by the same motion laws that you do. This actually puts a tactical spin on combat, as you can set yourself up on specific squares to wait for enemies to pass by so you can get hits on them as they pass you, or trap creatures in a corner so you can beat on them. This grid setup is used heavily in puzzle solving for each dungeon too, because as well as these rules for basic movement, there are specific ways that jumping fits into this mechanic. When it comes to pitfalls, Mike can leap across holes that are a single square wide, and around the floors of the dungeon you will see solid colored tiles that can't be walked on as normal, but are traversed by jumping onto and off of them. Quite often there will be switches hidden underneath these tiles that are revealed when stepping on certain other hidden tiles in the area, and these switches will do anything from simply opening doors and chests in the room, to causing hidden platforms to be revealed, secret items to appear, or blowing holes in nearby walls to create new exits. Match this with crafty tile placement using the single square jumping mechanic, and it makes for some absolutely mind-bending logistical puzzles. Other puzzles in the game will even require the use of special items, such as using a lantern to light up dark areas, or a magic rod that reveals ghosts in the area that you must destroy to open the door to the next room. As far as combat goes, it's another fantastically well presented aspect of Star Tropics gameplay. Mike's main weapon is a yo-yo that can hit a monster up to two squares in front of him, so you can attack enemies from just outside of their reach. This can make combat pretty intense, as with tougher enemies it becomes more about how many hits you can risk getting in before they reach you and deal damage. Different enemies also have different rules to how they can move about in the dungeons. Most enemies can't stand on the stone tiles that Mike can jump up to, so these can be used for safety in certain situations, but other creatures may be able to walk right over them as if they weren't even there. There's also flying enemies such as bats that don't even abide by the standard movement rules present in the game, and will generally move in any direction and even right over pitfalls. To tip the balance more towards Mike's favor, special weapons can be found throughout the game, 
so it's just an extremely powerful baseball bat that the character swings like Link's sword, hitting enemies in some of the surrounding squares as well as right in front of you, or flaming torches that can be thrown like fireballs. Items like this have a limited number of uses, and will disappear from Mike's inventory if you die or exit the dungeon. Having a lot of them in your possession will usually also cause you to be a lot more careful with your adventuring, because some of them are a godsend in boss battles. Later on in the game, you will even also get upgrades for Mike's yo-yo that allow for things like longer reach and more damaging attacks. On the subject of boss battles, the fights at the end of the main dungeon segments in this game are all really cool and unique. They're definitely the high visual points of the game too, as each boss is extremely well detailed and it can be a joy to reach them just to see what you're going to be up against next. The underground complexes of Star Tropics are not without their share of dangerous traps either. From platforms that disappear from underneath you as you step on them, floors that start to crumble as you enter the room requiring you to be fast on your feet as you rush through the exit, to arrows that fire out of the walls as you pass, or even giant bowling balls that roll down hallways crushing anything in their path. These traps can create a high degree of tension throughout the game too, and they just add to the fantastic action present as you explore the caverns and tunnels. Visually, the game is an absolute treat. The adventure segments of the game, where you wander around the overworld and talk to people, are bright and cheerful, with the characters given the super deformed look famous from RPGs of the era. The action segments of this game are very different in style, with much larger sprites for Mike and his enemies, which are all really well detailed compared to anything on the overworld maps. Star Tropics looks wonderful for an NES title, and it feels like a great deal of care was taken when creating this game. If I had to pick a part of Star Tropics that I had any real problems with, I'd have to say the difficulty of the game can be a little too high at some points. Don't get me wrong, I love a game to offer up a good challenge, but in Star Tropics, it sometimes borders on the obscene. Dungeons will have checkpoints that you're sent back to when you lose a life, but they're not exactly consistent with the length of time between them. It can be exceptionally aggravating if you die near the end of a dungeon, only to be sent back losing a good half an hour's progress. Also, when you lose all of your lives, you're forced to start the entire dungeon over again, and in some of the later chapters, that can be over an hour or more worth of game time. These difficulty spikes aren't that common in the game, however, and my issues with it are more because the game tends to be inconsistent in this regard. This is just a tiny black mark on an otherwise outstanding game, so it's easy to look past something that really doesn't damage the experience. The more frustrating parts of the game never once made me want to stop playing, so the difficulty's not quite as bad as it might seem. Despite some very small flaws, everything about Star Tropics combines to create one of the greatest 8-bit titles I have ever played. From the quirky charm present everywhere in the game to the unique action RPG gameplay and great level design, there's very little reason not to love this game. Almost anyone who's played Star Tropics will agree with me that it's one of Nintendo's finer moments, and that it's a disgusting shame that the game never got the attention it so rightly deserves. As for how well the game holds up today, well, as I said at the beginning of the show until recently I had no idea the game even existed, so I got to approach it with a fresh look without the blinders of nostalgia to cloud my judgement. If it plays this well now, I can only imagine how awesome it was for those lucky enough to have played it back when it released. This was absolutely the best game I played in 2012, and I felt it deserved an entire episode to express just how much I loved it. If you have an original Nintendo, I implore you to get a hold of a copy of this game. If you live in the US, it's not expensive at all, with copies being available online for less than 10 bucks. However, if you live in Europe or the UK, you may have some more difficulty tracking it down. And if you can't get a hold of a copy of your own, just find some way to play it. If you're a fan of Zelda, action RPGs, or classic Nintendo games in general, there's absolutely no reason you shouldn't give Star Tropics a try. Thanks for watching Old Game Plus, and don't forget to subscribe to SplitKick.com's YouTube channel to get all the latest episodes of Old Game Plus and more.